so um, I got interested on, on this problem um, last year, and as in Cambridge, we were talking with Malcolm quite a bit about this. And the idea was to see what happens to the evolution of the collapsing star if the back reaction of um, the radiation is, is included in, in its dynamics. And of course, the big question there was, is Hawking radiation produced during the collapse phase or is it produced after a black hole has formed? And, and that's something that I'm sure we will debate during the discussion because I've been debating this with Jim Bardeen and Bill Unruh and Don Page almost daily since last September. <laughs> um, so I will work on the assumption that uh, uh, the collapse is crucial to uh, the production of uh, the Hawking radiation. And uh, once you include it in, into the uh, dynamics of the collapsing star, then the equations tell us what happens. But first, let me go through a bit of history. I, I was surprised when, when I educated myself on, on this uh, history, how vicious the, the fight over the existence of black holes has been. Initially, Eddington um, was um, working with his... Uh, um, was working on, on, on the evolution of the stars and Chandra Sekhar, at the time, I think a postdoc, a very junior postdoc, uh, found out that uh, a collapsing star will, will collapse all the way to, to its center. That was in 1934. Of course, Eddington called that a stellar buffonery in front of everybody at the Royal Society. And, and Chandra Sekhar, who I heard was a very gentle person, left Cambridge after that and went to Chicago. And then a few years later, Oppenheimer and uh, Snyder, his student, um, studied this problem, the, the collapse of the star under its own gravity, and, and discovered pretty much the existence of uh, black holes, although they didn't call it black holes. Wheeler um, did not like the idea. He made a lot of fun of, uh, of that idea. But uh, um, in the 60s, when uh, because of Los Alamos, all, all the computing power was in place. He could go and solve those equations that Oppenheimer did in a very approximate way. He, he could uh, solve that with computers and discover that Oppenheimer was right and even coined it black holes. Then we have uh, Jacob Bekenstein in 1972-74 uh, uh, studying black hole thermodynamics and, and discovering the um, entropy area law and, and uh, at exactly the, at the same time, uh, Stephen Hawking was, was studying this problem, and uh, he discovered Hawking radiation. That was the time when, when as you all know, because you were the people that, that uh, laid the foundations of the field, um, that was the time when um, particle creation in curved space-time was developed. Uh, Leonard Parker had the, um, the, the uh, major role. In, in, in this discovery, and there was a whole group of people that I've mentioned some there, forgive me if, if uh, I haven't mentioned all of you, but um, the bottom line was that a changing gravitational field produces particles. A collapsing uh, a star has a gravitational field associated with it. During collapse, that gravitational field changes, and therefore, particles should be produced. That, that's in an nutshell the, the physical reason behind Hawking radiation. Ever since its discovery, there's been a lot of uh, talk and, and uh, paradoxes and problems, and, and they all boil down to just one thing, the information loss paradox. Although they come under different names, firewalls, complementarity, and whatnot. So this problem has been going around for, for 40 years. Usually when, when we end up with, with such uh, obvious paradoxes, the problem usually lies on, on some very elementary basic physics being missed out of the problem. That, that's the view I take anyway. And, and that was the motivation on why I thought that uh, perhaps just looking at the same old problem, but, but with fresh eyes and, and including the, the back reaction of uh, Hawking radiation on, onto the dynamics, would, would at least help me understand how this system would evolve. You, you all are familiar with the information loss paradox and, and uh, the firewall expected around a uh, black hole, which is pretty much due to the entanglement of the pair of particles created. One goes in, the other one goes out. We could obtain information that way, but the price to pay is that the energy produced by breaking this entanglement would create a firewall. And of course, we know we don't observe 
firewalls in, in, uh, around any stars. So something is awfully wrong. Back to the problem of the origin of Hawking radiation. So this was probably the easiest, most uh, straightforward way of, of looking at this problem. If Hawking radiation is produced, if particle creation, I should say, because it becomes Hawking radiation once it goes far away from, from the star and onto future infinity, if we sit with a detector there, we measure Hawking radiation. But if particle creation is occurring during the time that the star collapses, then the, the most straightforward way to look at it is to, to ask, well, how does that affect the dynamics of the collapsing star? Taking the view that I advocated at the beginning, and I don't know how to make this work. Sorry? Oh, it went on? <laughs> ah, okay. Now it's on. Okay. <laughs> so the, the view that um, particle creation occurs during the collapse stage, which is this part here, that, that would be the surface of the star, um, it com comes from, from, um, uh, from the argument that uh, one needs the changing gravitational field uh, in order to produce particles. And, and um, we, we can discuss more later, but uh, um, as I am now familiar by talking with Dom Page and Bill Unruh, they, they, they're people can bring the, the example of uh, the Schwinger pair creation, where we have a constant electric field that produces particles. That is true. But in fact, th this effect of particle creation is based, it's very, very similar, very analogous to, to that pair creation by a constant electric field. In, in fact, it's identical. It is true one can produce particles with a constant electric field. But the potential one gets out of that constant electric field, which is what, what determines particle creation, is space-time dependent. So even for the Schwinger pair production, one does have a changing, gravitation, uh, a changing potential and, and obtains uh, pairs of particles created at the end. Another reason I can give in, in favor of this view that uh, particles have to be created during, during the... Um, collapse of the star, and most of them are created very, very uh, near the horizon, just as about the star is, is about to produce, uh, to cross the horizon. But we can see from the Penrose diagram of the star that the very last, if we think of incoming and outgoing waves, null rays, the, the very last one to make it to future infinity, to scry plus, will be the one where the, the surface of the star is just about to cross the horizon. And there, if we sit at Scry Plus and, and expect to, to receive any more photons after that, that, that's not possible. One can argue against that as well and say, well, if we go to such and such coordinates, say Kruskal or um, other Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates, we, we might be able to distort this picture and, and see something come out even after the horizon has crossed. And this is a very important point. The rest is just mathematics, that, that anyone can sit down one afternoon, write down Einstein equations plus the energy conservations, plug them into a computer and get the answer. But the key is this part. Do we have the radiation to include in, into the evolution of the star before the singularity exists or after the singularity exists? If it's after, then this approach doesn't work, it fails. Once the singularity is there, nothing can undo it. But if this radiation is back reacting on the star before there is a collapse to singularity and before the star crosses the horizon, then, then there is hope that um, the singularity can be stopped, that the collapse all the way to the center can be stopped. The argument, and, and I've got all these arguments thanks to Jim, and uh, uh, Don Page and, and Bill Unruh, all, all the fights we have had for the last few months. But um, the, the argument, the strongest argument, I think would be the fact that we associate an entropy and the temperature with the black hole and the thermal spectrum that determines the temperature of that black hole of the horizon. If radiation is not 
produced before this star crosses the horizon, then I really do not understand why we can associate a temperature with that horizon and a thermal spectrum with that horizon or even a surface gravity with that horizon. If this radiation is produced after the black hole has formed, and then even being produced, it will take a long time to thermalize and, and uh, give us the, the thermal spectrum, then up until that happens, it doesn't make sense to talk of a temperature of the horizon because the radiation is not there yet. Yeah. Oh, I, I. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just interested to see the the part that comes out, so rather than the interior. Thank you. Okay. So that those were the reasons why um, I, I took the view that uh, all all of this uh, particle creation occurs during the collapse stage. Most of it will occur. It's true, as the star is really about to cross the horizon. But all of it is in place the moment the horizon and the singularity are formed. And, and uh, the, the rest, as I said, was just uh, including this radiation into the Einstein equations and the energy conservation. And there, as you know, there are at least two boundary conditions one can place on the quantum field that will give rise to particle creation. I, I took two popular ones to study this problem. One is the Hartle-Hawking condition in the far past. It, it's a very idealized way of looking at the problem, but it was easy to handle analytically. And, and before going into more sophisticated uh, numerical techniques, I, I wanted to, to have a handle on, on the problem analytically. The, the problem with the Hartle-Hawking uh, condition is that it's a symmetric uh, solution. The, the thermal bath of radiation is always there in the far past and the far future. So that in that sense, it's very uh, idealistic. But I, I will show the solutions for both, for the Hartle-Hawking and the Unruh uh, boundary condition. The Unruh bound, uh, boundary condition gives rise to an asymmetric situation. The condition says there is nothing in the far past, but there is a flux of particles that makes its way to future infinity. And, and that's the Hawking flux of radiation. So let, let me start with the simple one that can be handled analytically. Uh, the Hartle-Hawking, and then I'll show the numerical results for the owner. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, if you wanted to model the time dependence of the collapse, this problem would be identical to putting a mirror on the surface of the star and studying it as a... I, I am not talking of the star being a mirror. I'm saying if you wanted to model this problem of collapse with the analogy with the moving mirror, you could put a mirror on the surface and, and you'd have the reflection towards the center and the way. Is that... Okay. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That, that's exactly what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. So analogy in the sense of mimicking the time dependence of the collapse. Okay. Okay. I think one issue is that the moving mirror analogy, you're accelerating the mirror while the surface of the star, the stars in free fall, is not accelerating. <laughs> so uh, the trajectories for a moving mirror that mimic Hawking radiation do not behave like the surface of the star. Uh, but, yeah. I was referring to the um, uh, analogy, the, the mimicking of the behavior with the hyperbolic tension motion of the mirror that produces exactly the right expression for 
Hawking radiation. It's, um, in this problem, it, it's relevant because it can be handled analytically. In, it, it's a very simplified problem, so it can be handled exactly. Anyway, in the um, interior of the star, normally, the metric would have a lapse. And a, um, so it, it, the, the metric would be quite complicated. You'd expect, a, 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 due to the collapse, a time and radius dependence on, on both these functions, phi and, and lambda. Capital R is the area radius, and omega is the solid angle. In the exterior, for, for, for the very simple solution in the Hartle-Hawking uh, thermal radiation bath, uh, we considered a um, Schwarzschild solution, when in reality we know this is an object that is radiating, so the solution to Einstein equations should not be Schwarzschild. Schwarzschild is a vacuum solution, it should be a non-vacuum solution. So normally, one could look at a Vaidya metric or something more complicated. Anyway, as the first step, just, just to get a uh, feel for what's going on here, as I said, we, we consider the Hartle-Hawking vacuum um, of a thermal bath where uh, the energy density rho is related to, to the pressure by uh, one third. Defining um, two quantities, gamma, as, as the radius derivative of the area radius, and u would be the stellar uh, material uh, velocity defined by, by uh, this capital DTR, where capital Ds uh, denote covariant derivatives. I've defined them here. The condition on the formation of the horizon would be gamma crosses zero. So that, that's why I needed this quantity. And gamma is, uh, there is a relation between gamma and u given here. If gamma crosses zero, then an horizon forms and a singularity forms. So it, once we are at this stage, all we have to do is just think of the interior of the star as a closed Friedman Robertson Walker universe. Take the Schwarzschild outside, although, as I said, it is not um, a vacuum solution outside, but, but the radiation is small enough that we can think of a Schwarzschild metric, and just match at the surface of the mirror, match the two solutions at the surface of the mirror. The, the important quantity here in this closed FRW metric is this A of tau, which is a uh, scale factor for, for the interior metric. That will be the, the crucial one that uh, I can use to show that there are no horizons. As I described the steps, once we match the exterior and the interior metric, and in the interior we, includes, we include the um, uh, Hawking radiation, not just the stellar material. In this very simple setup, I, I took the stellar material to be dust. And, and in, in some sense, that, that's the worst scenario one can consider because dust would be in free fall. So if you can stop the collapse of dust, anything else would probably be easier to stop. So including the negative energy of uh, this Hawking radiation in the interior of, uh, of the star means that now we can solve all the equations and find out what happens to, to the interior metric of the star. As I mentioned before, A is the scale factor for this closed Friedman Robertson Walker universe inside the star. It obeys a Friedman type equation. So minus one over A square is the fact that the curvature of the star, so that's the curvature term. Rho naught is the energy density of the stellar material itself. Since it's matter, it goes as one over A cubed. And the last term would be the negative energy Hawking radiation going inside. And since we are in the Hartle Hawking, where this thermal bath is always there and its radiation is already thermalized, then this term goes as 1 over A to the fourth. A dot equals 0 would indicate that the star changes behavior from collapse to something else. So, as, as can be seen from, from this equation, there always exists a solution of A dot equals 0. All we have to do to, to figure it out is to, to just put the Friedman equation equal to zero and, and find out where that bounds of the star appears. A was, was the scale factor of, of the uh, interior metric of the star. And we know the star is collapsing. If A dot becomes zero, it means that the star has bounced, it's gone from collapse to turned around to, to an expansion. 
So that, that was the, the first and, and one, of course, from this equation can even figure out at what radius the, the bounds occurs. It's incredibly small radius. is the ratio of the Hawking radiation divided by the energy density of the star. But it's still telling me that um, this object does not collapse all the way to zero. Something happens as it gets close to the singularity that, that makes the star bounce. One, one can go even further and, and look at the condition on, on uh, the horizon formation, which, which uh, would be uh, gamma crossing zero. Since we have an expression for gamma and, and the set of uh, simple equations, just um, solving that equation and, and the motion of the, uh, of the stellar material shows that gamma never crosses zero. So, a trapped surface never forms in, in this situation. And the reason is because of uh, the stellar material velocity u having this extra term, the contribution from uh, Hawking radiation in the interior of the star. And, and that prevents the star, no matter how small the radius is, it, it will eventually dominate over the other terms and prevent the star from uh, creating a trapped surface. So the next stage was to, since that looked promising, the next stage was to go to a more um, sophisticated setup, have a more um, real solution, which would be including the uh, UNRU boundary condition and, and looking at a Hawking flux rather than a Hawking thermal bath of radiation. And, and that is more difficult to solve by hand. In fact, it's impossible to solve by hand. So Harold Pfeiffer, joined and uh, he did all the numerical work. Whoops. So what's going on in this case? Well, we, we set up the owner condition in the far past on the quantum field. Based on, on the pair creation picture, then there is an outgoing, as the star is collapsing, there is an outgoing flux of positive energy particles making its way all the way to future infinity and, and whoever is sitting there with a detector says they have observed Hawking radiation, but then the partner on this pair creation, the negative energy partner, the there is an ingoing flux of negative energy making its way towards the center of the star. So in, in a um, approximate way, we approximated the, the stress energy tensor tau AB of, of this ingoing flux of radiation in, in a very simple manner, as, as um, the uh, Hawking radiation flux, Q of H, uh, times Ki, Kb, where those are the ingoing null vectors. The star itself we took uh, to be made of dust again, so in, in that case the uh, stress energy tensor of, of the stellar material is this capital T, AB, and it is simply given, uh, N is the number of variants in the star, E is the internal energy per variant, and UA is the for velocity of the stellar material. Once we have the two ingredients, the stress energy tensor for the star, as well as for the radiation going inside the star, then, then the rest is just uh, Einstein equations, GAB equal 8 pi, TAB total, and energy conservation equation, where the total energy density, uh, the total stress energy tensor should be covariantly conserved. There is also a baryon number conservation there, which is this third equation. And this is it. This is the set of uh, equations that uh, can be solved analytically to tell us what the answer is. And I copied the, the three compact set of equations in the previous slide. These ones here are explicitly written here. So the metric now is, is uh, taken to be of this Vaidaya form with, with the lapse function and uh, uh, lambda both being a function of R and T. The ingoing radiation, stress energy tensor is explicitly given here. Uh, the stellar fluid stress energy tensor is the typical um, ideal fluid, but we, since we're talking of dust, then the pressure term is zero. So the second uh, term in brackets drops out, and the total uh, stress energy tensor is the sum of the two, star plus radiation. This is the set of equations that one needs to solve. The 
top ones are the Einstein equations with the Hawking radiation included. QH is the um, energy flux of Hawking radiation. Uh, capital U is the uh, velocity of the stellar fluid. Little n is the baryon number in the star. L, the luminosity of radiation, is not something we fix by hand. It, it's a variable one solves for that, that enters the Einstein equations. There are two auxiliary, uh, auxiliary uh, equations. The change of mass of, of the star's mass with respect to area radius and the change of phi of this left function here, which is pretty much like a gravitational potential uh, with respect to the area radius. One, this set is, is, is just a set of, equa of Einstein and energy conservation equations, uh, four Einstein equations and two energy, um, stress energy tensor conservation, the, the pressure and the energy components of, of uh, that conservation law. All of those can, are, are derived, that, that's a set of equations. There is only one input there, and it is this capital C. And that is the rate of transfer of energy from radiation onto the stellar material. That we don't know. We, we had to make up a function, of course, by, by putting certain constraints such that the radiation has to be <coughs> sorry, absorb, uh, absorbed fast enough in order to produce the right expression for Hawking radiation at future infinity. And uh, it should be such that um, the mass hits zero at radius equal zero. I have written those, yes. So that, that uh, C term, which is phenomenological, the, the rate of transfer of energy should be such that these boundary conditions are are satisfied at all times. At radius equal zero, at the center of the star, the luminosity expression, that, that is a variable that we solve for, should be equal to zero, and, and mass should be equal to zero. The, the last boundary condition, uh, left function equal zero at the surface of the star, is, is just a mathematical convenience for, for matching the interior and the exterior uh, terms. The final boundary condition before going through solutions of this set of equations, but this is it. This is the set of equations for the Hawking flux problem. The, the final boundary condition, which is the most important one, is the uh, luminosity of this radiation that is crossing, as you know, I mean, particle creation occurs somewhere outside the star. It, it's, it's a vacuum pair creation. Uh, by gravitational fields. So one partner in this pair makes its way through the surface towards the center of the star. And that's the part we are interested in, what's happening in the interior of the star. So we, we had to set boundary conditions on the surface of the star for, for this flux of radiation that, that is crossing the surface to make its way in. And, and the boundary condition was, was uh, uh, simply based uh, by, by, by the geometric setup of the problem. So. That, that was the boundary used. Uh, a very important quantity in this setup is this theta parameter, is the expansion parameter. If theta becomes zero, it's like gamma before in, in the easier setup. If theta becomes zero, that means that the trapped surface has formed. So we, we, when, when we looked for solutions to the set of equations I showed, we were specifically keeping an eye on theta becoming zero or not. Findings, which are all plots, because everything was solved numerically. The first one that really surprised me, and, and I still don't quite understand the reason why that is the case. It could be that our choice of, of that parameter C, of the rate of transfer, just accidentally happened to be a very special choice. So it, that could be the reason. We, we can blame that on the choice of C. Or perhaps there is some physical reason behind this. But, but the first finding is that the surface luminosity of this star, once it has uh, gone through collapse, but not hit zero yet, not, not hit the center yet, so at, at, after it bounces, basically, um, the luminosity of those stars is a constant independent of mass and independent of radius. 
and is the Planck luminosity, so it's a constant of nature, and is a classical quantity given by G and C. That I, even now, I, I don't understand. We, we tried, I've shown uh, three there, uh, mass equal four, uh, mass equal in Planck units, mass equal 8, mass equal 16, when the radius of the star starts from 10 times the mass of the star all the way to getting close to twice the mass. But, um, and, and in reality, although they are not shown here, we tried even mass equal 80, although the, the program started slowing down quite significantly. But even with mass 80, this result persisted, that these stars would shine after they had bounced, they, they would have this uh, uh, Planck luminosity at the surface. Now let me show the rest of the results. The top one, which is the most important one, is u as a function of time. u is the fluid velocity as a function of time. As you can see, it starts collapse, collapse, collapse. Going negative means collapse. And then uh, as it's getting close to the center, it bounces. It changes behavior, as shown in those purple lines. It starts decreasing, going less negative, less negative, until it's positive. And at that point, there's the tantalizing bit. The program breaks down. So I don't know what happens to the star after it bounces. Is there a core, a dead star left behind that looks like, for all practical purposes, from the outside, it's just some massive dead star, but with no singularity, so it would look the same as, as black holes would look, except that it doesn't have the horizon and the singularity, or is this star exploding? I don't know the answer because I don't know what happens to the acceleration and the velocity of the stellar fluid after it's bounced. The, the program just kept breaking down, so maybe we need a, a more sophisticated program for that. But that, this is, that, that is clearly the turnaround behavior from accelerated collapse to decelerating to completely turning around. And then we looked at the radius of the star. The dash blue line there would be the Oppenheimer Snyder. That, that was our uh, gold standard measurement to, to everything that, that we were checking, different masses and radiuses of the stars. So normally, and, and also the consistency of our equations, normally the, um, in the Oppenheimer-Snyder uh, type of uh, solution, black hole solution, for a star made of dust, as you can see here in the enlarged part, the star would collapse. It would, the, the red line there is the uh, Schwarzschild surface. So the star would continue collapsing. The star would cross the Schwarzschild for, uh, surface, and it would collapse all the way to zero. In our case, now the red line here is not the horizon anymore, is the surface of the star. And we took m equals 16 for this plot to, to generate this uh, graph. And as you can see, for most of the time, our system is collapsing very similarly to the Oppenheimer Schneider. So the, the collapse is going on, although there, there is some radiation making its way through. But as we get very close to, to the star's surface, uh, to the star's horizon, then somehow the radius of this star never becomes equal to 2m, so this star never crosses the horizon. Somehow it, it's just hovering above the horizon. Nora, yeah. Um, when it bounces, what is its mass? How much is it lost? Uh, half. And, and the half. mass is here. I'm showing for, for the same set of plots the, the mass is there. Is that exactly a half or just sort of very little? Where it's half its mass away and then bounces as well? So uh, r equal to m is the red line there, and, and this plot only corresponds to, to a star with mass 4 in, in Planck units. And, and we are solving for mass as a function of space and time of R and T from, from those equations. So you can see the behavior of the mass going halfway down just before. I visualize what this entity would be if it started out as a bottle of bare and it swallowed a bunch of negative energy and now it's bounced. Is it going to be anything to do with rain 
I, I don't know, because that, that, that's the annoying part. That's where the program breaks down, is look how close after you have bounced. It's this point here. So I can't tell. It's, uh, maybe it will just blow up into pieces, but I, I think, and I kept pushing Harold, but uh, M equal 80, for example, took a good four hours to, to just get this plot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it looks like almost you have a dead object. It, it looks like you have the star there, but it never makes it to R equal to M. I suppose I'm, I'm just trying to say that if you've accumulated a lot of negative energy, like half of it, how does that, in what physical form does that manifest itself after the balance? Well, you know, the sense of physicists there with a whole lot of equipment. Yes. But, but there, there is a rate of transfer of energy from radiation to the star. So that, that radiation, which is, uh, I mean, we, we don't know yet. That, that's something that, that needs to be calculated. At last year, I didn't have that calculation. What, what exactly the distribution of, of this radiation should be inside the star. So we, we approximated uh, that radiation with just something that goes with the speed of light inside the star. Negative and uniformly distributed. You've got something that's got N bearings, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got minus a lot of energy from the incoming. And there is a transfer, there is a crosstalk between the baryon, the, the material, and the radiation. Right. So, so I'm, I'm not sort of questioning your mm -hmm. calculation, just trying to envisage what the nature of the object is. Yeah. That is. No, that that's uh, yeah. I understand the question. No, 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 no. I'm not. I mean, uh, you just have. Let me show you the three equations. You just have a total baryon conservation number built into the set of the equations, but you also have a total energy stress energy conservation, which means that whatever the star loses, the radiation gains and vice versa. That is the transfer that's been modeled by that coefficient C. No, the, the problem is how can you conserve baryon number while at the same time eating up baryons by, by the transfer of uh, negative energy? And, and you can see from the equations, I mean, these things are coupled. So here is the equation for the baryon number, how it changes with time. And it's definitely coupled to Q of H, which is the Hawking energy flux. So whatever energy you absorb, whatever radiation you, you absorb, is what's reducing the mass of the star. Now, how can you conserve baryon number when, when you have that uh, problem? And I didn't try it. I should have written the, um, uh, the explicit baryon number conservation. But maybe I can point out here, E is the internal energy per baryon. So what you are conserving besides the, the baryon number is the energy transfer. Right, so the yeah. energy and the pressure. And so we end up with something that's got half the mass of the star with the same number of barriers. I don't know the answer to that. But that, that's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah, but I, it's um, so initially, in fact, the, the Hartle Hawking thermal bath was, the, the calculation was done in a shell. But because of the result being interesting, the, the bounce of the star, I, I thought uh, we'd face a lot of resistance with the result anyway, and people would start arguing, oh no, the shell is not very realistic, and, and the interior inside the shell, it's, you can't take that into flat space and all that. So I thought, well, if it can be done with a ball, why take a shell? <laughs> Yeah. 
But um, the the thing I'm, I mean, to to me, and and that that's something I, I was giving a s similar talk. I didn't have the numerical results a year ago, but uh, um, I had the Hartle Hawking um, semi analytical approach, and and I was talking to Jacob w last summer, and and he was right in, and 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 that's an outstanding problem that still remains. We can't really be completely conclusive, even with this set of equations that are solved exactly, if we don't know what, what the distribution of the stress energy tensor of radiation inside the star. And I, I know it can be done in two dimensions, that, that's something we've been looking at, but nobody has done it yet, so. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it, it's pretty hard. So even in this approach, I, the, the biggest approximation there is to say, well, this radiation is, is just going with the speed of light inside, when, when in fact there will definitely be a distribution inside that will determine. You, you can have shell crossing if, uh, if there is a distribution, which, which is space-time dependent. It seems to me that after all these years, somebody will just do that. Absolutely. We'll do it this week, all of us. <laughs> so. The, the whole approach rests on assuming that uh, particle creation occurs before the horizon and the singularity exists. If that is correct, which we can debate today and, and during the week, then it, it is sufficient to stop the collapse of the star to a singularity. The star will collapse for most of the time, but it won't make its way all the way to a singularity, so there will be no horizon and no singularity. Otherwise, with, with these preliminary findings, it looks like the star looks the same as, as what uh, the original black hole would have looked like. It, it's just some very heavy object with a very powerful uh, gravitational field, but it simply does not have a uh, singularity in the center, and it doesn't have an horizon. If it's correct, then um, there won't be an information loss problem, because without singularities, we don't have the information loss. Whether it's correct or not, we will find out in one year because of the experiment that is looking for horizons. So if that experiment finds an horizon, then, then we'll know for sure that there are black holes or not. Thank you.